Georgia. All right, let's get started. What chapter? 48. All right, we're going to do pediatric lecture. I am recording, so remember what we talked about the other day? Yeah. Okay. 43, thank you. It's chapter 43, not 48. It's 48, my Sorry. 48 mine, but 43 in this one. That literally melted from right. my parents' house to... EMS for children in pediatrics. Children have a very unique anatomical, physiological, and psychological characteristics that change during their development. What do we know about pediatric patients? They are small, but they're not tiny, tiny adults, right? They're not little adults. Everybody wants to say, well, they're little adults. No, they're not. Their bodies function completely differently than adults do. Alright, what is something unique to children that's not so unique with adults? Yeah, airway, airway. They got big heads, and that's right, which makes it what? Which makes them prone to head traumas, falls, accidents. accidents. They also don't have very good judgment, but then again, a lot of adults don't either. Alright, what else? What did you say? Uh, their airway. What about their airway? It's the narrow is hard, <laughs> it's different. Right, their airway is a lot narrow. All over is narrow. <laughs> Makes it easier for them to choke, especially on foreign bodies. And what do kids like to do? Stick things in their mouth that don't belong there. All right. We're going to go through a little lifespan development real quick. I know a lot of you had this in advanced CMT. First one is infancy. What do we use to check adult, newborn babies when they're born? An APGAR. An APGAR score. All right. A stands for? Years. P. Pulse. G. A. <laughs> R. Sad that I had to turn around and look at that, didn't <laughs> And what's the overall score you can get? What's the best score you can get? And what's the lowest score you can get? Zero. All right. Hush up. <laughs> the first three months, they sleep about 20 hours a day. And that's broken down into, you know, every other hour they fall asleep or they might sleep for three hours at a time, which just rarely ever happens. Three to six months, they start to sit up with assistance and start to roll over. All right, six to nine months. They're considered a bouncer crawler. They like to bounce all over the place, crawl wherever they can. And nine to 12 months, not only are they crawling, but they are learning to walk. And I feel the heat now. Do you? I feel the heat. If it gets really hot in here, I'm a beat cane wherever he went to. Yeah, it's getting a lot warmer in here. may or may not have touched it. Their heart rate gradually slows down. When they're first born, what's a normal heart rate for a newborn? Usually at 140 to 160, right? We get concerned, especially when it starts to get a little bit lower than 120. All right, what about a toddler? It's usually about 100, 120. Starts to gradually go down. You see how it gradually goes down? I would look at your vital signs in your book just to make sure that you're aware of what those are. Common illnesses, especially when they're first born, they have a lot of respiratory illnesses, which can be a problem for what? They have a lot of respiratory illnesses, have a lot of nasal secretions. Why would that be important? They breathe, they breathe through their nose, right? They're nasal breathers, obligate nose breathers. So their nose gets clogged up. Are they going to be able to breathe? No. So we have to frequently suction them, right? All these different diseases right through here we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. All right. What are newborns at greatest risk for? Use your clickers. What are newborns at greatest risk for? Nope. That might be why. Yeah, now I feel the heat. All right, you can respond now. There's some people not clicking. Everybody click? All right, they are at greatest risk for hyperthermia. They are also at risk for malnutrition, but greatest risk for hypothermia. All right, hypothermia is the correct answer. What happens when they become hypothermic? What does their body do? It starts to slow down, right? So what happens to their heart rate? 
Slows down. What's happened to the wrist for your right? Slows down. Everything slows down until it eventually stops. Right? So when they're hypothermic, what do you need to do to help them? Warm up. How do you warm up a newborn? Cover them with a blanket. What do you do with their head? Cover their head because they lose a lot of heat through their head, right? All right, the next age group are toddlers. <clears throat> they like to be praised. How many of you know a toddler? They like to be the center of attention, don't they? <laughs> they like to be the center of attention. They push. They'll do push-up, pull-up toys. They'll parallel play. Um, they won't do push-ups, but they push up on things. They get up, pull up on things, push up on things. They have routines. They imitate the parents, which can sometimes be bad, sometimes can be good. Did y'all hear about that um, New York teacher that's missed, or New York, North Carolina mm -hmm. teacher that's missing, whose three-year-old said, well, mommy's boyfriend beat her in the face, got a belt and whooped her butt. <laughs> and now she's missing. They don't know where she's at. Mm -hmm. Kids are very aware. They watch. They are very <laughs> prone to falls because why? They do have big heads and they're clumsy. I don't have a toddler that's graceful. They're all very clumsy. All right, a toddler is more prone to what type of injury? Use your clickers. What type of injury? Hmm. They're more prone to head injuries. We just said that, right? Did they fall? More prone to head injuries? Why are they not prone to broken, broken bones or broken extremities? They're still very flexible, right? Their bones usually don't break. They're still pretty flexible. All right, next are the preschoolers. This is the magic phase. They ask why a lot. They are very curious. They um, fear mutilation. They like for their boo-boos to be covered up. They don't like to see boo-boos. A little bit of blood is dangerous. They think it's horrifying that you're going to die. They are curious and have an urge to explore. So if they have an urge to explore, what are they at risk for? Getting sick. Getting, Getting sick, infections, because they like to dig in the dirt, maybe eat dirt, play with things they shouldn't play with. Hmm. They're also curious and they're explorers, so they wander off, right? I mean, kids, you know, get lost in the department store because they're playing in the racks closed. I used to get lost in the racks closed. I used to get lost in the racks closed. I thought I was never going to. You still do that now, don't you? Yeah. Kids are very <laughs> younger children are very curious. All right, next are the school age kids. They are scared of death. They think anything that harms them is going to kill them. They are terrified. So this is the group that you that are what we call your very literal thinkers. You have to really explain things to them, get on their level, talk to them, tell them what you're doing. Um, two key areas of development. They have the onset of puberty, which starts at the end of their school age, mm. age frame, which is what? When does puberty uh, usually start? Uh, uh, 12, 14. 12 to 14, usually when puberty starts. <laughs> Last but not least, in the pediatric age group are your adolescents. What do we know about your adolescents? <coughs> they are smart, but aren't they? They are invincible. They are 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Right? Nothing can harm them, nothing can hurt them, and their friends mean everything. All right? Parents are stupid, they don't know anything, they're not going to wear their seatbelt, they're not going to go the speed limit, and they're definitely going to not drink and drive. Right? Uh, they are very keen on privacy, so if you have an adolescent patient who you have to expose for any reason, make sure you do keep them private as much as possible, keep them covered up. Peer pressure causes a lot of problems. STDs are also an issue with this age group. Why? Sexually active. They're in their experimental phase. They are at risk for sexual assault. Why is that? They're a lot more vulnerable, right? They don't mind taking a drink for some cute guy who wants to give it to them. All right, let's talk about the um, anatomical features. Their head, we've already discussed that, up to the age of eight, their head is proportionally larger. 
They have a high percentage of blunt trauma in children. It does involve the head and the face because their head is larger. They do fall over more. Um, they hit their head on things. If they fall off their bike, their head's going to be one of the first things to hit, which is why we always encourage them to wear helmets. When is the fontanelles closed? Where, do you, where are your fontanelles? The anterior ones right here, right? And the posterior ones back here? When is the posterior one closed? By six months of age. Usually by six months it closes. When's the top one closed? About 18, About 18, 18 months. months. All right, airway, we already discussed that. Airway is a lot narrower than the adults. What is the narrowest part of a child's airway? might get very mad at you for missing this because she tells you this in basic ENT. That was a year ago. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, then she you know that in advanced ENT and then she just told you this last semester too. Right, yeah. ring is the narrowest part of the airway. She's not going to get mad at 42%. percent right. 42% of y'all. The jaw is proportionally small and the tongue is proportionally large. So they're at risk for choking, especially in their tongue, they become unresponsive, what's going to fall back in their airway? Their tongue. All right, epiglottis is a mega shape and extends into the airway about 45 degrees. Which blade do you think you're going to use if you have to intubate a pediatric Miller. patient? Miller, why? Because it's straight and it gets that epiglottis up and out of the way. And I just told you the answer to that question. Crap, I forgot to put it in there. I can do it anyway. Yeah. <coughs> Somebody's going to get it wrong just for spite. See, I'll tell you. 27% of y'all are stupid. Just kidding. Hey, that was yeah. 27% of y'all don't listen. That's really, there's 28 of y'all in here, so really, I guess it should be 90% of y'all don't listen. There's not Alright, we are going to discuss this. ET tube size, younger than the age of one, length is based on what? which is known as the Braslow tape, right? Older than one year of age, the uncuffed formula is age in years plus 16 divided by four. Gives you your size of tube. Age in year plus 16 divided by four. It does, which is why the Braslow tape comes into effect. Always use your Braslow tape. It gives you a definitive, use this size tube, use this much medication. The way you take all the guessing out of it. Because your pediatric patients, especially in code situations or traumas, are very stressful anyway. Using that Braslow tape is a really good tool to have. And that's just been in the last 10 years that Braslow tape's been used. Can you imagine how them older medics feel? In the last 10 years? Mm -hmm. We have Braslow tape since our ambulance is from 1992. 92? Yeah. No. Does it say 92 on it for real? Yeah, I promise you it does. I met him at a conference we had when I first came to work here, and he had just developed the Braslow tape. There was a there was a tape, a pediatric tape, and everything. Because me and Elizabeth Collins found it, like we need to get rid of this. 92. Wow. Must have been his first run. That would have been 22 years ago. It hasn't been 22 years. That's crazy. All right, also have suction handy. Why? Especially when you're ventilating a patient, what's going to happen to their GI tract? Especially if you're just using a BVM. If they're not intubated and you're just bagging them, what's happening in their stomach? It's also getting filled with air and getting distended, so they're going to vomit, right? If an intubated child deteriorates, use the dope mnemonic to identify the problem. Have y'all heard of the dope mnemonic before? Did I talk about that last semester in airway? Check for displacement, obstruction, check for pneumothorax or equipment failure. All right. Chest and lungs, as we said earlier, their blunt <coughs> bones are very pliable. So if they have trauma to the chest, is it going to break the ribs and cause a flail segment? No. Problems like that? Probably not. No. It's going to go in, have some maybe some crush injuries to the lungs or some contusions to the lungs and the heart. 
Also, it can cause contusions to the liver and spleen, whatever is in this area. But they're more than likely not going to break. I already said that. Lung tissue to pediatric patient is very fragile. Pulmonary contusions from trauma and pneumothorax from varitrauma are very common. What's a pneumothorax? Air in the chest cavity, right? A hole in the pleural space somewhere in that chest cavity causes air to fill up. How do you fix that? Needle decompression. What else? Positive pressure ventilation. If it's an open chest wound, what do you need to do with it? Occlusive dressing. Okay. All right, a seven-year-old male wrecks his bike and the handlebar strikes his abdomen at the left upper quadrant. Patient complains of abdominal pain, back pain, and shoulder pain. He has bruising around his umbilical, umbilical area one hour after the accident. What organ is most likely injured? He has abdominal pain, back pain, and shoulder pain. He has bruising around his umbilical area. Breslow's first prototype is 85. 85, his first prototype? There we go. You may have seen like when we did that conference. That conference was just three years ago, and he had literally just done it. <laughs> All right, for you people who chose gallbladder, why would you choose gallbladder? Back pain and shoulder pain? Where's your gallbladder at? They can have back pain, but they mainly have what kind of pain? Epigastric pain. If it's a gallbladder problem, it's usually epigastric pain, which is right here at the sternum, right? Because your gallbladder sits to the right of the sternum. All right, what about your pancreas? Pancreas is more over to the right, right? All right, what would be the pancreas? It's not going to have shoulder pain with pancreatic injury. Liver? You pick the liver. How many of you pick the liver? 42 percent. <laughs> liver does sit up high. The correct answer is the spleen. The liver is in the middle, right here. The liver goes all the way right through here, but it's mainly in that right side. But it is in the top part, mainly on the right side. This is where your liver is, right through here. The spleen, spleen is very, very, very vascular. And that's why it's really dangerous. The spleen, spleen is extremely vascular. And any trauma to that can cause a lot of internal bleeding. And so the bruising of the umbilical area shows that they've got some intra-abdominal bleeding. Shoulder pain is the key here. If they have a liver, I mean, excuse me, a spleen injury, they're going to have shoulder pain. That's called that referred pain. They don't have any injuries to their shoulder, it's just referred pain. It's easier. It sits right in front of your liver. Like your liver is right here, your spleen is literally right here. When you have anything that's traumatic to this area, like a steering wheel, things like that, the spleen is going to be the first thing that's going to get hurt. And a lot of trauma is going to cause damage and lacerations to the liver as well. Gallbladder kind of sits like up under. Sits like, like right the there. Liver. Yeah. Okay. Right about here. Not a Not Who have you chose spleen? Who's at 33%? Just three, y'all. 33%? Three. Okay. Good job. Immature muscles of the abdomen and the child often give less protection to the internal organs. The liver and spleen are proportionally larger and a lot more vascular. So any injuries to those can call intra-abdominal bleeding. Bones, we've already talked about this. Your bones are very pliable. Any child that has a sprain it needs to be treated like a broke because it can have injuries to the growth plate. What's the growth plate? Gap where they're growing together. So any injury that can cause problems there can cause a broken bone that just can't be seen on x-ray. All right, get your clickers ready. What is the site for an IO insertion?
there's some nice clicker that's not working. <coughs> and there's somebody that didn't sign in. Jeremy didn't sign in. No, it didn't count like 10 times. <laughs> All right, where's the lateral aspect of the tibial tuberosity? In the wrong spot. <laughs> lateral, where would it be? Outside. Outside, so it'd be right here, right? Medial aspect is right here on this flat surface. Do you feel that flat surface on your knee? What would you call the aspect in between the medial and lateral aspect? Um, the anterior? You can put one there too. If you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it still worked though. So it okay. <laughs> Open doors to the ambulance and Tommy Bean looked at us like, that doesn't look right. And I was like, Face it works. Mm -hmm. Medial aspect of the tibial tuberosity is the best place for not insertion on a pediatric patient. All right, all strains and sprains should be considered fractured. Always treat them as such and mobilize them. <laughs> what did you say? Uh, it was me. I said that the lower lumbar is the best spot to go blood glucose. <laughs> all right, the skin is thinner and more elastic than the skin of the adults. Most children only two years of age have less subcutaneous fat. So they're at risk for, we talked about earlier, they don't have as much fat to keep them nice and warm, warm so they're at risk for hypothermia. Mm -hmm. Thinner skin of a child allows for deeper injury to occur from heat or cold exposure, so burns or frostbite and cause more damage. Respiratory system, their tidal volume of infants and young children is proportionally smaller than that of adolescents and adults. What is your tidal volume? <laughs> the definition. <laughs> How much are you breathing? What's the number? How much? Usually about 500. So they're taking really shallow breaths. They breathe in 500. So if I'm breathing in about 500 milliliters of air and I'm breathing in a rate of about 20 minutes, am I adequate? I'm pretty adequate, right? What if I'm breathing 100 milliliters at 24 breaths a minute? Am I still adequate? No. Why? So I'm not giving as much tidal volume in, right? Just because I'm breathing faster, it's not compensating for not enough air that's coming in. And the muscles are the main support for the chest wall. They can tire easily, especially in patients who are in respiratory distress. Can lead to respiratory failure and ultimately respiratory arrest. <coughs> Your pediatric patients, are they at greatest risk for cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest? Respiratory, because not many of them have cardiac abnormalities, right? Cardiac output rate depends on infants and children. Excuse me, rate is dependent in infants and children. The faster the heart rate, the greater the cardiac output. Special considerations when managing patients in the pediatric setting. Child may be in shock despite a normal blood pressure. Do we check blood pressure on kids? Over the age of three, right? Anybody under the age of three, it's really not going to matter. But somebody who's possibly in shock, what's their blood pressure going to look like? What they're compensating. What's their blood pressure going to look like? Normal. Their blood pressure is going to be normal, right? And it's going to compensate and compensate and compensate until they deteriorate and their blood pressure is going to be in the toilet. Bradycardia is often a response to hypoxia. So how do you fix bradycardia? Oxygen. Give them oxygen. Because what's hypoxia? Low oxygen. So you give them oxygen. Get them warm and give them oxygen. What is a late sign of shock in a pediatric patient? is a late sign of shock because they're going to compensate and compensate and compensate until their blood pressure goes in the toilet. Okay? So what's a late sign of shock in a pediatric patient? Hypotension. Hypotension. Huh? 
An assessment of shock should be based on clinical signs of tissue perfusion, so check their level of consciousness. Are they alert and oriented? Are they confused? Are they completely unresponsive? What's their skin color look like? Somebody who's in shock, what's their skin color going to look like? Pale, cyanotic. All right, oxygen saturation. Also checking capillary refill. Capillary refill is really good for those patients who are under the age of six. Works best for patients under the age of six. Can you use capillary refill on anybody but it's really good for kids. Hypertension in infants and children can be defined as a systolic blood pressure of less than 60 in your neonates, less than 70 in your infants, less than 70 plus two times age in years in children that are one to 10, and less than 90 for children over the age of 10. All right, so which patient's hypertensive? Think about it, just look at it. In a minute, we will. Which patient is hypotensive? A 15 DA old with a blood pressure of 62 over 40, a two month old with a blood pressure of 72 over 50, a nine year old with a BP of 80 over 40, or a 12 year old with a BP of 100 over 60? Great answer is a nine year old with a BP of 80 over 40. All right, so 15 DA old is a neonate. Anything less than what, systolically? 60 systolic in a neonate. Two month old is an infant, anything less than 70. 70. A 12 year old is greater than 10, of course, so it's anything less than 90. Then take less than 70 plus two times age in years in children one to 10. So if they're nine years old, what's two times the age in years? 18, so it would be a systolic less than 88. There's just 80. Okay. Nervous system does develop throughout childhood. Developing of neural tissue is fragile. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. It can be easily damaged. Their neural tissue can be easily damaged. It is fragile. They do have greater cerebral spinal fluid space around the neural tissues. It does help. It's kind of like a buffer. Huh? Think about neural tissues being very fragile when you think about shaken baby syndrome. What happens in shaken baby syndrome? They get shaken. What happens to their brain? It squashes back and forth in that cerebral spinal fluid, right? It can only buffer so much. Uh huh. It can only buffer it so much. Spinal column is more pliable, so they're not at risk for spinal cord injuries. Children can be free of injury even after falls from very great heights. Like a child can fall from up here, down, and why not have any broken bones? They can have some internal injuries because their bones are pliable, right? Especially if they landed on their stomach. Their ribs can go into their chest causing cardiac contusions, lung contusions, liver lacerations. Metabolic differences, infants and children have limited glycogen and glucose stores. So what does that make them at risk for? Hypoglycemia. Where is glycogen stored? Or glycogen, excuse me. In the liver, and it's stored as what? Glycogen. All right. And whenever your blood sugar gets low, what is secreted? Glucagon secreted from what cells in the pancreas? Your alpha cells of the pancreas. And what does it do? Glycogen to glucose and puts it out in the bloodstream, right? To increase your blood sugar levels. Glucogenesis. Glycogenesis. Children are also prone to hypothermia. We've already talked about that. <clears throat> uh, pediatric patients can experience significant volume loss from vomiting and diarrhea. Their electrolytes can be completely wiped out from a few episodes of vomiting and diarrhea. General principles of the pediatric assessment. Worry about the patient's age, their maturity level, and their physical development when you're thinking about how you're going to assess these patients. You would assess a two month old a lot different than you would assess a 16 year old. Brief overview of the principles of the pediatric assessment. Evaluation of the scene, scene size up just like anybody else you do. Primary survey, vital functions. Transition phase is a lot different. We don't really have that in our pediatric, or excuse me, our adult population patient assessment. Focus history, a secondary assessment, and then a reassessment.
All right, your scene size up. What are you worried about? What are you looking for on any scene that involves a pediatric patient? You're looking for mechanism of injury, your nature of illness. What else? Any life threats, apparent life threats that could be at the scene that could be dangerous for you or your patient? Like, is the are you called to a swimming pool? Are you called to a motor vehicle crash? Are you called on a medical call? If you're called on a medical call, what are you looking for in your surroundings? Signs of abuse, anything that could be potentially not safe, like an iron that's plugged in, it's left for the baby to grab a cord and pull it down on them. Medication bottles, beer bottles, drug paraphernalia, all these things are part of your scene size up. You remember the pediatric assessment triangle? I should remember this, it should just be over three. It deals with appearance, work of breathing, and circulation. So I use this when I'm walking in to assess my pediatric patients. I walk in and Jeremy's my pediatric patient, I should be able to look at him and tell if he's in distress or not in distress. I should be able to say if my transport needs to be rapid or if I can stay on scene for a few extra minutes. What is it? Huh? <laughs> oh, I, he's good. We, we can stay. He's non, <laughs> non-urgent. So I'm looking at his appearance. What am I looking at? How he looks. What does he look like? What is his demeanor? What is his stature? How is he behaving? Right? Can I tell what his mental status is? What's his muscle tone like? All right. Checking his work of breathing, what am I looking at? How he's breathing, what does he look like? Is he in a tripod position? Is he laying down flat? Is he using any accessory muscles? What else? I'm going to move into circulation. I'm going to check skin color. Do I notice any obvious bleeding? Is he pale, pink, cyanotic? Is he diaphoretic? I should be able to tell that from across the room. You really can use this on any patient, but it's really good for your pediatric patients. Also use the APCU and glossococcoma scales. How do you manage an urgent condition versus a non-urgent condition? Urgently. <laughs> Urgently or non-urgently? How do you do that? You have a three-year-old who's obviously in respiratory distress. How are you going to manage that scene? What are you going to do for them? I'm being serious. Are you going to go snatch up a three-year-old and jump in the back of your ambulance and take off running? What are they going to think? You're going to put them in more respiratory distress by doing that, aren't you? Right. Try to take your time. You don't want to take a lot of time, especially in an urgent condition, Take as much time as you can safely to get on their level, do eye contact with them, have the parents be as involved as possible. All right, child's airway should be patent and breathing, should proceed with adequate chest rise and fall. What are some signs and symptoms of respiratory distress? Nasal flaring, wheezing, retractions, maybe being in a sniffing position. What's a sniffing position look like? You're sniffing the air like a dog, right? Dog sniff the air. Why do they do that? No. Opening their airway, right? Okay. All right, what are some signs and symptoms of respiratory failure? When do you go from distress to failure? What changes? Your body's having a really hard time compensating and you're deteriorating, right? But your mental status is what changes. When you go from respiratory distress to respiratory failure, your mental status is gone in the toilet. Right? They're becoming unresponsive or confused, very lethargic or obtunded. All right, checking their circulation. What are their color? What do they look like? Are they pink and warm or blue and cyanotic? Or blue or cyanotic, excuse me, same thing. Pale. Blood pressure should be measured in children over the age of three with an appropriately sized cuff. You wouldn't measure a three-year-old's blood pressure with an adult-sized cuff, would you? You'd get an inadequate reading. All right, <clears throat> check for visible signs of hemorrhage and control those as needed. Work of breathing, I don't know where that slide went to, there was one in there. Work of breathing, you're assessing their respiratory rate and quality, also assessing their volume. Do they look like they're taking in enough air or are they doing shallow respirations? Do you notice any retractions? Do you notice any um, audible wheezing or strider in those sounds that are not normal? What is the transition phase? 
This is usually done with your non-critical type patients. It's exactly what it says, right? You're transitioning them. When you're going up to assess a pediatric patient, you're not just going to jump in there and start doing everything to them, are you? Like Anthony said, you're going to get on their level, make eye contact with them, show what you're doing to them is not going to hurt them by maybe doing it to the mom or the dad or doing it to yourself, letting them hold things like your stethoscope, be a part of their patient care. This is a nice little transition for them. If the patient's unconscious or acutely ill, management should proceed quickly to emergency care and transport. If they're unconscious or ill, or critically ill to where they're not really going to care what you're doing to them, take them on and do the managing their life threats as best as possible. When obtaining a focused history for an infant, a toddler, or a preschooler, you're often going to have to elicit information from who? Parents or caregivers, right? Parents are not always the caregivers. Don't just assume because they're parents there means that they're the caregiver. A lot of times here lately from what I've seen is a lot of pediatric patients are cared for by who? Grandparents. Grandparents. What's the deal with that? Why are people not taking care of their own kids? Drugs or kids having kids? Or work. Or work. That's my dad keeps Does he have custody of them though? No. That's what I mean. They oh. have custody of them. That's not that they're babysitting. That's, oh, that's a grandparent's job, right? <laughs> He's there every day. So <laughs> but they, he doesn't have overall custody of them. Like, he doesn't mandate what all goes on. That's it. All right, your school age and adolescent patients can provide most information by themselves, especially your school age kids. They like to be their center of attention. They like to be able to help you and be very informative and tell you everything that's going on. I was um, on a clinical myself Friday when I got done and went to pick up Logan from school. He's like, so mom, how was your day on the ambulance? I started telling him about my day and he's like, oh mom, that sounds horrible. Do you have any pictures? <laughs> <laughs> so I pulled up some pictures that I found on the internet of the wreck that we had on 280 because I did not take any pictures myself. Because I'm a student, I'm not allowed to do that. Everybody else had out their camera phones like, choo, 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 choo. I did not take any. I, I didn't take any though. Even somebody was like, Brittany, why don't you take a picture? I was like, because I'm not supposed to. I'm a student today. I'm not allowed to do that. And um, so I showed him a picture. Showed him a picture of what had happened. It was one of the ones that Elizabeth White did. And so I started showing pictures. He's like, oh, mom, that's awful. He's scrolling through my phone. He's like, was there lots of blood? Did he die? Tell me about what happened, Mom. And I'm like, wow, he's just a very inquisitive little thing. He likes to know every possible detail that he can possibly get. He doesn't act like he's terrified of anything. He's so just intrigued. He tells me all the time, I want to be a firefighter, and I want to be a paramedic, and I'm going to be a police officer. I'm like, you're going to be all three of those? You have fun with that. Huh? He's not He's not. He's very serious. He already knows how to live. you got to work all three. That's right. you got to work all of them. Um... <clears throat> Transition phase, paramedics should question adolescent patients in privacy away from their parents and family members, especially when it comes to dealing with sexual activity or sexual problems, pregnancy, alcohol, any of those things. Do you honestly think an adolescent is going to be truthful in front of their parents? Nope. They're going to be probably truthful with you, though, right? Because you're a stranger. And a lot of your adolescent patients like to feel big and tall, right? They think that all this bad stuff that they're doing is just good stuff for their image. They have no problem telling you what's going on. When it comes to staying in front of their parents, it ain't going to happen. For your focus history, it can be obtained using your sample and your OPQRST. You remember what those are? Do we need to go through those? Yeah. You sure? We can. Next is your secondary assessment. All right? You're doing a head to toe assessment. If it's a significant MOI or somebody with a significant nature of illness, you're going to probably do a rapid assessment, right? Whether it be a rapid trauma assessment or a rapid medical assessment or a focus medical assessment. But if it's someone who you can take time with to do a detailed full head to toe assessment. You want to proceed from the head to the toe in your older children, but for your pediatric patients, your young children, you want to proceed from the toe to the head. Why do you do that? Makes them feel comfortable, gain their trust. Now, do you do that if it's a significant MOI or significant nature of illness? No, you don't got time for that. All right. It depends on the patient's condition. Some or all the following assessments may be appropriate. Blood pressure, we said, is over the age of three. Is it going to do you any good most of the time anyway? All right. Pulse ox. Get that on pretty much everybody, right? Capillary refill is really good for your pediatric patients under the age of six. Hydration. How do you check for hydration? Skin turker. What if they're under the age of 18 months? Anterior fontanelle. Do what? 
You, you pinch them anyway? Anterior fontanelle. If they're dehydrated, what's the fontanelle going to be? Sunken in. If it's bulging, they can either be really ticked off and screaming bloody murder, or they could have increased intracranial pressure. All right. EKG for serious ill or injured children. Check their pupils. Measurement of their body temperature. How do you do that? Do you have a thermometer on the ambulance? Go by touch. No. Touch. Feel them. Skin to skin. <sighs> reassessment. You always reassess, especially after any life-threatening um, abnormalities that you find that you do interventions for. You always reassess your interventions. Purpose is to monitor the patient for changes in their respiratory effort, anything that has to do with their ABCs, mental status, and vital signs. How often is a critically ill or injured child assessed versus a non-injured or non-critical child? The critical patients, how often do you assess them? <clears throat> Every five minutes. Y'all are so smart. So smart. General principles of patient management really depend on the patient's condition. If it's something to do with their airway, breathing, or circulation, you're going to manage those life threats, whether it's putting them on oxygen, um, positive pressure ventilation, controlling any obvious bleeding, any pharmacological therapy. Because there are drugs that you can just give to patients just to give them. Your pediatric patients, like if they need epi or they need... Uh, Benadryl or they need glucose. Are you able to just give those? Why? Always got to call and ask, which can be a pain in the butt. Non pharmacological therapy, whether it be oxygen, transport considerations, you can usually make a transport decision within the first two minutes of being in the room with them because you use your patient assessment triangle, right? You can use that to determine if they're critical or not critical. Comfort measures. What are comfort measures for pediatric patients? Do you want to give them some morphine? Make them feel good? Yeah, probably not. What? Maybe if your if your service has stuffed animals on the truck. Stuffed animals on the truck, or maybe bring their own stuffed animal from home, right? Something that comforts them that they like. Bring that from home. Also, keeping them with their caregiver. What else? Being nice. Being nice and gentle. Getting on their level, talking with them. ABC management, what are the basic and advanced methods paramedic can use to manage the airway in a child? What are your basic methods for managing airway? What's the very basic one? What? Opening the airway using the head tilt chin lift or if it's a trauma with a possible spinal cord injury, jaw thrust maneuver. All right, what else is very basic? An OPA or an MPA? Oxygen like nasal cannula, non-rebreather. What's an advanced way to manage the airway? Intubation. How is circulation managed in a child? Right, how do you do that? What is it? What are some methods to manage circulation problems? Control bleeding is very basic. Fluid resuscitation, if they're under the age of one, how much fluid do they get? 10 per kilo. If they're over the age of one, how much do they get? 20 per kilo. Heart's not working. Decompression. CPR. Pharmacological therapy. If they're hypoglycemic, they could get dextrose. If they're having an allergic reaction, they could get epi, Benadryl. Nausea, vomiting, they could get Zofran. What are some other pharmacological drugs that you could use? Phenergan, which they don't use that on the truck anymore. Usually it's now Zofran. For yeah. Benadryl. Benadryl can also be used for nausea and vomiting. All right, what are some other methods that you could do, other drugs on the truck that you carry that you can give for whatever reason? Narcan. Narcan's used for opioid overdoses. What about seizures? Valium, Ativan. All right, additional therapies indicated depending on what type of illness the patient might have. Spinal mobilization for your trauma patients. Electrical therapy, cardioversion, shocking if they're cardiac arrest, I don't know what kind of rhythm they've got. Cooling them down or warming them up. <clears throat> Hemorrhage control, we already talked about that. Transport considerations, depending on what's wrong with them, you might decide to take them to the nearest facility or to a the nearest pediatric trauma facility. Use ground or air transport. 
Psychological support is important for paramedics to provide psychological support to pediatric patients and family members and caregivers. Be sympathetic. Actually, be empathetic. You're never supposed to be sympathetic. Be empathetic to the patient and their problems, or their condition, whatever's going on with them. Also with the family. Be supportive as much as possible. Respiratory compromise, we've already talked about respiratory distress, how it goes to respiratory failure, and then once they're in failure and they're decompensating even more, they're going to go into respiratory arrest. They're a lot harder to get back that way. We're going to talk about all these different airway diseases. We're going to talk about the difference between those. All right, upper and lower foreign body airway obstruction. Obstruction of upper or lower airway by foreign body may cause partial or full obstruction. What things can cause airway obstruction? <laughs> right, but what kind of things do pediatric patients get into? Huh? Sputum, their tongue, Legos, hot dogs. Hot dogs. That is a paramedic student who, um, Virginia, last time? What? Mike Ikes, those little candy things? I had a paramedic student last go around who was also a medic in the Army and came out and she had to actually go through the medic course here to get her medic license in the state. And she um, had a three-year-old who was eating a hot dog and got choking the hot dog. And they actually wound up having to cry the child and just kept pulling out pieces of hot dog. The patient actually died because they couldn't get an airway, nor could they get the hot dog out of her airway so that she could breathe. So that was key. How horrible would that be? It made me never want to eat a hot dog again. It's just horrible. Did Steve ever tell you the story of the little girl with a balloon? Yes. Isn't that horrible? That just made me want to cry when he told me that story. He told us that the very first time we ever taught pals here. She was outside holding, playing with a balloon, and for some reason she was by herself, three-year-old outside. I never let my children out of my sight, much less let them outside playing with something like a balloon. Huh? We're, they're in the growing room right now. Inside locked doors. <laughs> what? Room. We'll have to do it after class, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Other people might not want to hear it because they might be ready to go. Rob's ready to go to sleep. All right. What are signs and symptoms of airway, airway obstruction? Strider. Strider. It's all upper airway, right? Upper airway obstructions are caused by foreign bodies. You have strider. All right. What about lower airway obstruction? What's caused, what causes lower airway obstruction? Fluid, swelling. Copious amounts of mucus, like for your patients who have chronic bronchitis or CFPD asthma. Infants. <laughs> Poor infants better not be CFPD. They could have cystic fibrosis, though, causing lots of mucus. All right, what do you do for a child who's choking? What if they're talking to you or coughing? Encourage, encourage them to cough. All right, what if they stop coughing and you hear no sounds whatsoever and they're doing that? Huh? That's called the baby hum. That's called the chest thrust and back slap. All right. That's for under the age of one. Then you can also have the Heimlich maneuver, right? All right. Get your clickers. What is a viral upper respiratory infection that has a barking cough as a trademark? What upper respiratory infection causes a barking cough? Y'all are so smart. Fruit has a barking cough. All right. What do they also have? Can they have a fever with croup? Yeah, they're going to have a fever. They can have strider. How do you fix this? What do you do for them? Give them some flow by oxygen. Take them to the hospital. Put them in humidified oxygen. Also, you can put them in a bathroom, whatever the hot water is going. Lock, shut the door. Let the steam get in there. Also, open up your refrigerator or the freezer. Cold air or humidified air can also help if you're at home. All right, but as far as the paramedic goes, humidified flow by oxygen, position of comfort, keep them calm, transport. Do you start an IV on them? Why would you? Gosh. Why would you be angry? You're going to a baby. 
We don't do that to babies. We do that to your drunk overdoses. We don't do that to babies. All right, what is a bacterial infection of the upper airway with a fever and drooling along with a muffled voice? What type of condition is this? Bacterial infection of the upper airway with fever and drooling. Epiglottitis. Alright, what is epiglottitis? It's an inflammation of the epiglottis. What does the epiglottis do? It flaps. It closes over the trachea when you swallow, right? So that food doesn't go down in the trachea. That becomes inflamed, and what's it going to do? Swell. Swell. Go over the trachea and cause an upper airway obstruction, right? What do you do for these patients? Take them to the hospital, position of comfort, flow by oxygen. Unless that starts to irritate them, then you just leave them the heck alone, right? Let mom or daddy hold them, take them to the hospital. Do we start IVs in these patients? Yeah. No. Because you don't do anything that causes more distress. Then why they, call us? they start to scream and get distressed, and you all are being ridiculous today. <sighs> anaphylaxis. What's anaphylaxis? Miss Tammy and Jeremy, I think, are the only ones, and Kelsey. Anybody else? Hey, and I'm Rob, not, I'm not doing anything and Audra, <laughs> and Sam, they're actually paying attention, no, and I have paying smart attention. mouths. I, I don't know, because you have to pay attention to have smart mouths about what you're saying. <laughs> All right, <coughs> what's anaphylaxis? Miss Tammy, what's anaphylaxis? A lactate and allergic reaction. A and allergic reaction, which causes what? What kind of problems do you have with anaphylactic reaction? Bronchoconstriction, vasodilation. What happens with vasodilation? What happens to our fluid? It goes into the third space. It goes into the third space, and we start having third spacing, which is makes us what? Swell. Swell and look like the Michelin Man, right? But we don't have a lot of circulating volume. Yeah, we already look like this. Are we anaphylaxis? They also go into respiratory distress. What kind of breath sounds are you going to hear? Uh, wheezy. wheezy. You can also hear Strider, right? Especially if their upper airway starts to close off. Circulatory compromise, we start having third spacing. Gastrointestinal symptoms? Can you have some nausea and vomiting? Not really going to have diarrhea with anaphylaxis, but they can have some nausea and some vomiting. Severe anaphylaxis, your patient can be unresponsive. Primary assessment can reveal hives, swelling of the lips, oral mucosa, strider, wheezing, diminished pulses. Why are they going to have diminished pulses? They're going into shock because they have that third space, and so all their circulating blood volume, or all their circulating fluid altogether, all that excess fluid is getting put into the third space, which is called a lot of swelling. So you're going to have a hard time filling the pulses anyway, but you're also not going to have a good circulating, vo ugh, circulating volume. Treatment? How do you treat it? Epi. If it's a severe allergic reaction, what kind of epi are you going to give? Uh, IV or IM? IV. 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 All right. What else can you give them? Lord. I didn't think you What'd you say? Benadryl. Benadryl. They can get Benadryl too. What else? Supplemental oxygen. Oxygen, maybe by a non rebreather. Or if they're in severe dis or in distress, but their oxygen sets okay, then you get them some flow by. All right, fluid resuscitation for shock. So they got the third spacing, so they're not going to have as much circulating fluid. All right, what about bronchodilators? Sure. What's a bronchodilator that we can give them? Ibuterol. All right, they get to the hospital, what are they probably going to get? Some steroids. All right, get clickers. In a severe allergic reaction, what is the dosage of epinephrine? Severe allergic reaction in a pediatric patient, what is your dosage of epinephrine? Correct answer is a 0 0.01 milligram per kilogram. It's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be severe. Yeah, it's supposed to be that. I'm sorry, I hit it at the wrong thing. It's C 0 0.1. Double check your book just to make sure, but I'm pretty sure it's C 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram and one to 10,000 IV. Look in chapter 12. Yeah, go to chapter 12 because this isn't right. No, because if you that's one point milligram per kilogram would be more. Somebody look in chapter 12 real fast at Epi. Yeah, because the adult dose for the other one, 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 the
one milligram. Equal to fifty-five milligrams. Mm-hmm. Because if you give it per kilogram, you're giving it like one milligram every hour. Every kilo. Yeah, for epi for I M for children, it's a zero point zero one milligram per kilogram of one to one thousand solution. I'm sorry. IV is only for adults. <laughs> Pediatric patients only get IM. They never get IV epinephrine for, you tell me that, you're over there half asleep, aren't you? Rob is the only smart one in this room. I'm not at all today. That is my mistake. So for the recording, IM only for pediatric patients. And for y'all too. IM only for pediatric patients, not IV. And it's 0 0.01 milligram per kilogram of 1 to 1,000 IM. All right. Bacterial tracheitis, what is that? Uh, bacterial infection of the trachea. Bacterial infection of the trachea. Children typically present with cough, strider, command respiratory distress. They usually have some type of viral infection prior to this. Keep them calm as possible. Anything that causes strider is a swelling of the upper airway, right? So if a child gets more irritated or more distressed, what's that airway going to do? It's smaller and smaller and smaller until it eventually closes off, right? So all patients who are having some type of strider or respiratory distress, we want to keep them calm as much as possible. What's asthma? Chronic inflammatory disease of the airways. It causes what? Wheezing. Wheezing. Breathlessness. Chest tightness. Cough. Inflammation. Bronchoconstriction. Everything is starting to close off in the lower airways. So what do we need to do for these patients? Bronchodilators, you want some albuterol, what else? Flow by oxygen, transport. Mm -hmm. This common of the children the age of two years and older, it is difficult to diagnose. They don't ever diagnose a child with asthma until they're two years or older. And it's usually by recurrent problems that they've been having. Other respiratory conditions in children can cause similar signs and symptoms. Acute exacerbation can be triggered by an infection. It can also be triggered by a change in temperature. Some patients have exercise-induced asthma or an emotional response. Also, an exposure to allergens. What are some common allergens that children are exposed to that can cause problems with their airway? Peanuts, peanuts is the big, biggest one, right? Everybody's going to no peanuts, anything. Logan couldn't even take peanut butter and jelly sandwich to school. It's crazy. I understand why they do it because you don't want, you know, if your child has a peanut allergy, you don't want them to be exposed to that at all. But you would also think that you would educate them and say, hey, just because your friend has a peanut butter jelly sandwich does not mean you need to take a bite. Yeah, it's like discriminating the peanut. It is. It's awful. It's supposed to have back for these kids. Yeah. That's like people who are allergic to chocolate. They what a horrible life that would be. That's just some parents over their child that. <laughs> I'd be devastated if I can eat peanut butter and chocolate. Patients can decompensate, so be ready to aggressively manage the airway, especially if they're having an asthma attack that's not being controlled by bronchodilators. All right, what is an inflammation of the lower airway due to a viral infection such as RSV? <clears throat> this is an inflammation of the lower airway due to viral infection such as RSV. RSV is a pretty serious infection, isn't it? usually happens to children. I swear Annabelle had it for like six months and she's only 10 months old. They keep it forever. It seems like it does not go away. Okay. Bronchiolitis. It's inflammation of the lower airway due to a viral infection such as RSV. Manifest with tachypnea, which is what? Fast breathing. Tachy means fast. Pena means airway or respiratory rate. To get me is increased respiratory rate. They also have wheezing, so how are you going to treat it? Bronchodilators, flow by oxygen, position of comfort, transport. 
Okay, you gonna start an IV on him and give him some fluids? Yep. No. No. No, no, no. All right, what's pneumonia? Infection of the lungs. How are they going to present? Fever. Crackles and rails. They can also have some wheezing. Just general malaise, not feeling good at all. What are you going to do for these patients? As a rule of thumb, we don't stick our pediatric patients unless we absolutely have to. Right? Well, they, only have the they, they might get oral antibiotics. They might not be that bad. All right, they're going to get bronchodilators, <laughs> flow by oxygen, and transport, position of comfort. Keep them comfortable. Are you glad everybody being here? Yes, everybody, I'm going to stop real quick. You can take five minutes. Yes, we can. Go ahead, open the windows. All right, pneumonia. We've already discussed pneumonia. What's pertussis? Don't touch that. Open Listen, the windows. That's what Hayden did last time. And then it, was, it didn't work, so I turned it all over all the way back down. Pertussis is what? Whooping cough. Whooping cough. How do you get pertussis? I mean, it's so somebody who has pertussis, right? You haven't gotten a vaccine? This is coming about now because a lot of parents are not vaccine, vaccinating their children. Why are they not vaccinating their children? They think this is going to cause autism. So they're not vaccinating their children. So all these childhood diseases that we don't hear about anymore are now coming back to light, like polio, things like that. Somebody who's got pertussis and having whooping cough, you need to keep their airway open and patent, flow by oxygen, transport in position of comfort. And this is a rapid transport. All right, cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease that affects respiratory and digestive systems. <laughs> Chronic mucus production, so they're going to have tons of mucus. They're going to have crackles, chest pain, tachypnea. Assess their ABCs, administer supplemental oxygen. Transport in position of comfort, rapid transport. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia. This is the seven of the lung conditions found in premature neonates who require ventilator support along periods of high concentrated oxygen. These patients will also be on home oxygen. Remember your ABCs. Consider positive pressure ventilation. Patients may require intubation. Shock. How do we treat for shock? Keep them warm. IV, fluid. What time are you going to give IV and fluid? All right. There's three different types of shock that we're going to talk about. First one is um, well, what's the difference between compensated and decompensated? One, the body is uh, able to maintain like, uh, perfusion and stuff. Right? They're able to maintain perfusion, so their blood pressure is going to be fine. If they're compensating, what happens when they start decompensating? What happens to their blood pressure? It drops, right? It deteriorates, which is a late sign. All right, what type of bulimic shock? Low volume. Low volume, and this can be from dehydration, dehydration blood loss. Allergic reaction. All right. What is normal full of fluid bolus for a child less than one year of age? 10 per kilo. Greater than one? 20. Management, position of comfort, supplemental O2, keep them warm. If it's a bleeding problem, control the bleeding and volume replacement. Get an IV access. You cannot find a suitable vein, do an IO. All right, distributive shock, decreased vascular tone. These patients can be septic or vasodilation, third spacing. I guess really it's not going to be hypovolemic shock for anaphylaxis. They're going to have what they call distributive shock. Treatment is volume resuscitation. If it's an anaphylactic problem, treat with IM epinephrine. What's the dose for IM epinephrine? 0 0.01, 0 .01 milligram per kilogram of... 1 to 1,000 IM because we do not give IV epinephrine to pediatric patients, right? No matter what your teacher tells you, don't do it. All right, cardiogenic shock as a result of the pump failure itself can be present in kids who have underlying congenital heart disease, myocarditis, or any type of rhythm disturbances. Signs and symptoms, they could be lethargic, have an increased work of breathing, impaired circulation, they can have mottled 
or cyanotic skin or pale. Initial management, put them in a position of comfort, manage their ABCs with oxygen and transport. Don't really give them fluid resuscitation if they're in cardiogenic shock or have any type of cardiac abnormality because it can cause more fluid overload, cause a lot more problems than good. In children, blood volume accounts for 7 to 8% of the total body weight, which is 70 to 80 milliliters per kilogram of their body weight. Example, a blood loss of 100 milliliters in an adult is a 2% blood loss, but 100 milliliters of blood loss in the infant is 15 to 20% of blood loss, which can result in shock. Somebody let a dog on hornet wasp thingy in here. Yeah, and somebody can kill it because I'm really allergic to those things. Well, right, so IV is yes. enough, right? Um, <laughs> For me, yes. yes. For me, yeah. Okay. Just make sure. Yeah, we're good. We okay. don't have anybody. Hey, is your heart rate really good? Yeah, I'm like. We got some fake though in the lab. It's a dirt dog. 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 Body surface area and hypothermia. We already said their body surface area is. What? Thin. Their skin's less, thinner. Less for their mass. They have less for their mass. They have more body surface area, body surface area, but for the smaller amount of body that they do have. Hypothermia makes resuscitation and drug therapy less effective sometimes. Why? No circulation. No circulation. It's not circulating as well. All right. Blood's shunned into the vital organs, and it's not really going everywhere. All right. Maintain the patient's body temperature by how? How do you do that? Warming them up. Keeping them nice and warm, making the back of your hand looks warm. Cardiac reserve. Infants and children already have a high metabolic needs. You know, they don't keep as much glucose stored. We talked about that earlier. As a result, they have less cardiac reserve than adults for stressful situations such as shock. Their little hearts can't take all the stress that shock endures. They wind up decompensating. You're going to provide valerious support, reduce their anxiety, keep them calm and comfortable, maintain good temperatures. The cardiovascular emergencies are relatively very rare in children unless they already have some type of cardiac abnormality. Often lead to volume, or often related to a volume or infection problem. And that identified through their primary assessment. Dysrhythmias, they can have bradyarrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias, and of course, pulselessness. What's a brady dysrhythmia, bradyarrhythmia? Slow heart rate. This can be caused by, what did we say earlier, that H word? Uh, hypoxia. So what's the first line of defense with bradycardia? Get them warm and give them oxygen. And they're going to probably need an IV too. All right. Well, if it's an infant and their heart rate's less than 60, what are you going to do? CPR. CPR. All right. Initiate cardiac monitoring. Of course, the child's asymptomatic. No further treatment is needed in the field. If pulse is lower than normal age, normal range for age and perfusion is poor, you're going to have to do chest compressions. Attempt an IV or an IO. They have heart blocks. They can have heart blocks too, first degree. They can be asymptomatic, often an incidental finding. No intervention is usually needed. Second degree can progress, of course, to third degree. This is a pediatric bradycardia algorithm. They have this in your book. I didn't look to see. Your little ACLS book has it in there, but does your Paramedic book have it in there? I can't remember if it does or not. <coughs> anyway, you do need to look at your algorithms for your pediatric um, cardiac problems, your bradyarrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias, all those. I would look at those. If we need to print these off, let me know. But they should be in your ACLS algorithm, or excuse me, PALS algorithm little book. Y'all had to get a PALS book, didn't you? No. 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 You had to get ACLS. Mm -hmm. You need the PAL slides over here. I mean, you can see them on the website too. But I think you do better if you got something physical in your hand too. Your epi dose is on here. We've already talked about that. If you've got a patient who's got a low pulse rate and poor perfusion, you're going to maintain their airway, give them oxygen, leave them on the cardiac monitor, IVIO, 12 lead if possible. 
Cardiac compromise continues. You're going to do CPR if the heart rate is less than 60 with poor perfusion. Next, that doesn't help. Use epinephrine. IV. IV. 0.01 milligrams per kilogram of the 1 to 10,000 IV every 3 to 5 minutes. That doesn't help. You can also give atropine. Tachyrrhythmus is a pulse greater than normal for greater than the normal for the age group. Subdivided into narrow complex and wide complex, just like adults, narrow complex or wide complex. Narrow complex is usually your SVTs. It's greater than 220 beats per minute for an infant or more than 180 beats per minute for a child. Treatment really depends on their perfusion and their stability. Are they perfusing? Do they have a good blood pressure? Do they have a good capillary refill? Are they pink and warm? Poor perfusion, they're poorly perfused, they have a poor blood pressure, they have an increased capillary refill, their skin's pale, cool, or cyanotic, you're going to skip the adenosine, right? You go right to the synchronized cardioversion. All right, if you do have to give them adenosine, what is the rate, or excuse me, the dosage of adenosine for a pediatric patient? Get your clickers. Wake up. A is the correct answer. First dose is 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram. Second dose is 0 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. That was a pretty, that's pretty much everybody guessed on that one, right? Mm -hmm. yep. I think we all right? guessed, but we thought we had been taught. <laughs> 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram for the first dose. Second dose is 0 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. What's the third dose? There's not a third dose anymore. All right, then you flush it with 5 to 10 cc's of normal saline. What's a wide complex tachycardia? VTAC. Yeah. How do you treat that? Shock them. Shock them. Give them some fluids. Right. If it's stable, they might consider it an anti medication. If they're unstable, cardiovert. CPR. What is the correct medication and loading dosage for a pediatric patient in stable ventricular tachycardia? You have to give an antidysrhythmic for a patient who's in VTAC but stable. The doctor decides to let you do a antidysrhythmic. Which one are you going to use and how much? milligrams per kilogram. For stable ventricular tachycardia in a pediatric patient, amiodarone 5 milligrams per kilogram. All right, this is your other algorithm. Treat the underlying cause, maintain their airway, give them oxygen, fluids, 12 lead. What? Oh, yes, yeah, 0.5 to 1 joule per kilogram. If not effective, then you go up to 2 joules. Sedate if needed, but you don't usually sedate them if they're poorly perfused. You don't have time for that. And nobody, yeah. You don't have time for that in anybody. Nope. All right, pulseless arrest. What do you do for that? CPR. Ventilate. Survival rate is rare. It's pretty poor and patient to go into pulseless arrest. Provide high quality BLS skills, CPR, and enter airway. Attempt an IV or an O. Of course, put them on the monitor. Additional treatment, epinephrine or vasopressin. Same principle as it is with an adult in cardiac arrest. You can give epi, but you can also give vasopressin for the first or second dose of epi. 
Epi is 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram of 1 to 10,000 IV every 3 to 5 minutes. The vasopressin is 0 0.4 to 1 unit per kilogram with a max of 40 units. And that's just a one-time dose, right? And that can replace the first or second dose of Epi. Here's your algorithm for that too. Some people are visual learners, they like to have it in their hand. And I'll print you guys, I'll get y'all these printed off. Alright, congenital heart disease. Do you remember back to our neonate lecture that we had umpteen years ago? It seems like. All the congenital heart defects. Is it three weeks ago? It feels like it was a lot longer than that. I would go back and refresh your memory on those too because I'm not hitting them again. So I would go back there and look at those as well. Conge the congestive heart failure. Heart can't meet metabolic demands as normal psycholo uh, physiological venous pressure, signs and symptoms. In infants, they can have tachypnea, retractions, and grunting. Children, profuse sweating, increased work of breathing due to the feedings. They're having a really hard time eating, overworking their airway, also overworking their heart. Initial management, manage your ABCs, provide oxygen, diuretics as needed, but that's based on medical direction. Myocarditis is a condition that is infl causes inflammation of the heart, can lead to heart failure. Viral infections are pretty much the common cause for myocarditis. And with myocarditis, anybody that has myocarditis usually has to have antibiotics where they have dental procedures. Isn't that kind of weird? Why is that? Huh? Mouth full of bacteria. And what happens whenever you get your teeth cleaned? Get scrapes and cuts. Bacteria can get in the bloodstream, go to the heart, and cause more damage than good, right? They often present with signs and symptoms such as the CHF patients do. Dipsy on rest, syncope, tachycardia. They can also have a murmur. These patients, transport, position of comfort, ABCs, cardiac monitor, oxygen, IV access. We also have cardiomyopathy. There's two types. You have the dilated cardiomyopathy. Heart becomes weakened and enlarged, typically due to a viral infection or medication toxicity. Then you have your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is usually the muscles getting thick. Why is a heart muscle getting thick? Working harder. Same principle when you go to the gym and work out. What happens to your muscles? Or what do you want to happen to your muscles? They get thick, right? Same principle, when your heart, your heart's a muscle, it starts to work and gets harder and harder and harder, working a lot harder than that muscle is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then what happens to your blood volume? Poor perfusion, well I meant to say perfusion, excuse me. You have poor perfusion, right? Because your heart's not pumping like it needs to. All right, assessment and management of cardiovascular emergencies. Of course, begin with your patient assessment triangle. Always manage your ABCs. If you can, determine the cause, try to fix it. Prioritize your patient, transport. We talked a little bit about vital signs already. BP is really ever gotten in anybody under the age of three. You get a heart rate and a respiratory rate on everybody. And your pediatric patients, their heart rates can be irregular, so you might want to check it for a whole minute. Always check the respiratory rate and their heart rate for a whole minute. Evaluation components noted when assessing a child for shock, check their LSC. Are they alert and oriented? Are they lethargic, obtunded, confused? What's their skin look like? What about their mucous membranes? Capillary refill. Check their circulation, respiratory rate, blood pressure, temperature. A patient with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea for three days is likely to suffer from what condition? Use your clickers. A patient with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea for three days is likely to suffer from what condition? What are we going to do for that patient? Fluid. Give them an IV. Give them an IV. Give them some fluid. All right. This is dehydration in the infant. Here's how you can check for that. And they're going to have all urea, which is what? It's a nice, pretty word for you to memorize. Huh? It does have something to do with urination. That's true. What is it? You might know. 
decrease or no urination? Poly is too much. And urea is actually no urination. So all urea is a decreased urination. They're going to have weight loss. They're going to be tachycardic. Reduced capillary refill. Their eyes are going to be sunken in. Their fontanelles are going to be decreased. Their mucous membranes are going to be dry. All right. What do paramedics carry on the ambulance that can aid in determining a child's weight? Knowledge. <laughs> Knowledge. They just have to guess, right? Yep. There's two right. Which one is the best answer? There are two right answers, but what is the best answer? The correct answer is the Brazola tape. The PD wheel also will have the weights on it there for you, but can you measure somebody with a PD wheel? It's not like you just roll it next to them and it guesses for you. I mean, you're welcome to try. And last time I checked, <laughs> we didn't carry scales in the ambulance. So, huh? Back it. Shut up. <laughs> this is Braslow tape. We do have some of this in the lab. Uh, I know we have our PD wheels too. Have y'all seen those? Did they finally get some because there wasn't another? there? We had some in the cabinet last time I saw them. In the same cabinet where the glucose monitor and stuff is? That one? Did they check in there? Um, they need me. Somebody looked good time. No. What is inflammation of fluid containing membranes that surround the brain and spinal cord? What is this known as? The inflammation of fluid containing membranes that surround the brain and spinal cord. Can't talk today. Oh, Sorry. they let you change your answer at least. Well, I don't know when it's saying works or not. When it works, when it doesn't. The correct answer is meningitis. That is correct. This is an example of a patient who has meningitis. Poor little baby girl. What is all this? That's beta nine, so I don't look there. But what is all this? Purpura. Purpura. And what is that? It's like a petechial purple rash that comes whenever somebody's got meningitis. It's a distinct trademark of meningitis. How are you going to treat this patient? ABCs, IV, fluids, transport. Good BSI. Thank you. Very, very, very good BSI. You have to protect yourself as well as everybody else. Put a mask on the patient if you have, if you can. Otherwise, mask everybody else. All right. What is the most common cause of new onset of seizures in children? The clicker for you. That was the easy question. There's two people that didn't take. It was taken 11 a while ago. Fever is correct. And it doesn't have to be an extremely high fever either. It could be a fever that's lasted for, you know, a day or two and cause the fever seizure. Logan had one when he was about seven months old. We had just got back from vacation. Every time we go on vacation, one of my kids gets sick. I don't know what it is. Um, huh? She quit going on vacation just sitting there. Yeah, is that what I need to do? Um, but we had been on vacation. He had had nausea and vomiting and... Um, had a little low grade fever when we got home I mean it was just he was seven months old I think no yeah seven months old so we were doing Motrin and Tylenol and had did it alternated every four to six hours and I remember holding him in my lap he was sound asleep and I was sleeping because he we neither one of us had any sleep the next thing I know I'm waking up because he's just shaking just uncontrollably shaking and his eyes rolled back in the back of his head and he's just shaking and I remember jumping up and screaming and running in the bedroom where my husband was and laying him on the bed saying he's having a seizure. And Josh just looks at me and he said, so what do we need to do? You're the nurse. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. What are you supposed to do? <laughs> Didn't last that long. It quit. And then he was very groggy and went up sleeping for four hours after that. And called the physician's officer and like, we'll just bring him in when the office opens and we'll check him out. Um, but it doesn't matter. They don't have to have a very, very, very high fever. It could be a low-grade fever. They didn't do anything. They didn't do anything at all. Just monitor. All right. Common cause of seizures in adults and children, noncompliance with drug regimen, like if they have epilepsy and they're not taking their drugs like they're supposed to. Head trauma. 
intracranial infection, brain tumors, metabolic disturbances, has to do with the electrolytes or glucose, and poisonings. How are you going to manage a patient having a seizure? Leave them alone. Make sure that there's not anything that can hurt them. Once they stop having a seizure, what are you going to manage next? Airway, airway right? Their airway's got to be controlled. They're unresponsive. What's going to happen with that tongue? It's going to fall in there and they can bite it, yes. Also, it can fall and obstruct their airway. So, manage their ABCs, IV, transport. You can also give them what kind of medications? Valium. What else? Ativan. Important history, um, you need to know how many seizures they've had. Like if you go up and ask them, well, when did this start? Well, they just started having a seizure today. Well, how many they had today? How long did it last? What were they doing right before it happened? What were they doing afterwards? Have they been ill or sick? Characteristics of the postictal period, you should note their level of consciousness. If they're moving, are they talking? Do they have any impairments? If medical direction allows, what is the best treatment for a four-year-old with a fever? Now, I don't know anybody that carries this on the truck, but you're allowed to. What would you give a four-month-old with a fever? for a second. Motrin is an anti-inflammatory, right? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. What is the age requirements to get Motrin? Six months, Six months and older. Why? Um, what will it do to the heart? That hole is supposed to be closing up? Oh, yeah. The anti-inflammatory keeps it from becoming inflamed and closing up, right? So we do not give Motrin to anybody under the age of six months. So the only thing here that they can get is acetaminophen. They can get Tylenol. Ice cubes in the hot spots? Uh, no. Is that an ice cube? Really? No. Pace mm -mm. patient in a cool bath prior to transport. Do you really have time to put your patients in the bathtub before you leave? No. 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 The best answer here is acetaminophen, also known as Tylenol. All right. What is a continuous seizure activity that lasts more than 30 minutes or is recurrent without an intervening period of consciousness? What is this known as? Tonic-clonic seizure is actually the type of activity that they're doing, the actual type of seizure that they have. But static, status epilepticus is a recurrent seizure without them actually waking up and becoming conscious or a seizure that lasts longer than 30 minutes. What are you going to do for these patients? ABCs. Are you going to have to try to start an IV on somebody who's actually having a seizure? If it's lasting for a long period of time? Yeah. You might have to try to restrain their arm where you can get an IV on them. I mean, I'd rather try to attempt an IV than attempt a rectal valium on somebody who's actively having a seizure. What is the drug of choice for seizure control in children? It can be given IV, IM, IO, or rectally. This is the drug of choice. Which one do you prefer to give? The correct answer is diazepam, which is also known as Valium. Is Ativan. Alright, the PAMs are good for seizures, but that the PAM is actually the best choice for, two, for children. Alright, what's the correct dosage for IV diazepam? Correct dosage for IV diazepam. Call it med control? Well, if you call med control and they give you a dose, you should know the correct dosage because what do you need to do? Verify, right, before you give your medication? Yeah, they are. You sure? Wow. The correct answer is B, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram with a max of 10 milligrams. A is the dosage for lorazepam. A is the dosage for lorazepam. That is correct. 
All right, lorazepam is alternative to IV or IO administration of diazepam. has a long duration, six to eight hours. Can be injected IM, given IV or IO. Side effects are similar to diazepam. What's the correct dosage for diazepam? I mean, excuse me, for lorazepam. This medication is one you also have to make sure you push at least over two minutes. Zero point zero five to zero point two milligrams per kilogram. It's in that dose range, but it wasn't the full dose range. Zero point five, excuse me, zero point zero five to zero point two milligrams per kilogram is the correct dosage of lorazepam. And I would think it's safe to say that you're going to have some dosages on your test. I haven't finished writing it yet. So, I would make sure you know those. What's hydrocephalus? Fluid on the brain, right? Lots of fluid in the, in the skull. Lots of fluid on the brain. All right, so what are you going to do for that? You're just going to transport them. What are some problems you think you'd be called for with somebody who's got hydrocephalus? Headache. A headache. Shunt malfunction, maybe? If they've got shunts, they could have a shunt malfunction, which manifests as a... Headache. All right, they're not getting that fluid shunted off the brain. They get excess fluid in the brain. What's it going to cause? An increase in their ICP, ICP right? Increase in their intracranial pressure, which is going to manifest as a headache. All right, they can also have decreased LSC. They can also have vomiting and visual changes. Manage their increased intracranial pressure. ABCs, rapid transport, position of comfort. Closed head injury. Head trauma is very common in children. A small number of children who appear to be at low risk may have an intracranial injury. Evaluate any child with a head injury for signs of potential abuse. Always look out for those signs of abuse anytime you respond to a pediatric call. Management is ABCs, frequent neuro checks. What's viral gastroenteritis? Upset tummy, right? Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. What are you going to do for that? ABCs, position of comfort, IV, fluids. Right. What about appendicitis? How does that present? Mm. Initially, pain around the Initially, pain around the umbilical area, right? Also going to have some right lower quadrant pain. Going to have nausea and vomiting. What causes appendicitis? Isn't that weird? But it's so strange how that is. My grandmother used to tell me it's because if you bite your fingernail, then you're going to get appendicitis. Well, that's also kind of They don't find them. They'll find fingernails in your penis. I used to bite my fingernails, but I never ate them. Well, people would like swallow them. Oh, that's kind of gross. The doctor who took mine out told me a story that said back a long, long time ago. That's what the doctor said. That's interesting. Did you have an upset stomach before your appendix? I had got messed up. <laughs> How old were you? I had mine out my very first semester of teaching here. We were in registry, and I had been hurting since Matt Knight retired. We went to Matt Knight's retirement party, and we were on our way home. We stopped at the gas station to get gas, and I all of a sudden just started having this pain. I was like, I mean, it just like took me off guard. I was like, really painful and it was just intermittent so it didn't last but every time it would come it would get stronger and stronger and get worse and worse and um, I had been upset had an upset stomach and just wasn't able to go to the bathroom like you wanted to and no I couldn't not as good as I wanted to and so that's whenever I found that out it was like really that that's why it causes appendicitis but I went three days hurting my out ruptured I'm surprised it didn't but these patients are going to complain of right lower quadrant pain and a lot of pediatric patients who complain of belly pain, what do their parents usually do? Ah, uh, you'll be all right. Ah, you'll be all right. Ah, uh, you'll be all right. That one's up rupturing. 
These patients are going to secure an IV, ABCs, transport, and position of comfort. All right, gastrointestinal bleeding. This can be an upper and lower bleeding. They can have, I cannot say this word. Who can say it for me? Thank you. What? <laughs> Where do you see breastfeeding? <laughs> We're talking about GI bleeding. Right next to you. Oh, okay. I was going to say, where do you see this thing? <laughs> no. What is that? What is that? Gross bleeding. Gross bright red bleeding. All right. If they have melanin, what is that? Dark bleeding. All right. This can be caused from anal fissures, from constipation, straining. They're going to have a tear. Uh, maternal bleeding during breastfeeding or ingestion from blood from uh, nasal, nasal surgery, or if they've had their tonsils removed, they're swallowing a lot of blood. What are you going to do for GI bleed? <laughs> ABCs, position of comfort, and transport, right? <laughs> if they have port fusion, you can get IE. All right, and What is that? The bowel. That's where the bowel just goes right in itself. It literally does a backwards flip, and it goes up in itself. And it can cause... Um, the blood supply to that part of the intestines can be cut off and it can cause necrosis of the tissues. They have a lot of abdominal pain. Um, this usually happens in your infant. How do you fix that, you think? ABCs, rapid transport, they're going to need surgery. They can also fix it with, what's something we put in the nose? NG2. All right, mecal diverticulum is a congenital mal malformation of the small intestines. Patients will have painless rectal bleeding. ABCs, transform position of comfort. <laughs> Pyloric stenosis. Presents with projectile vomiting after feedings. These patients are going to have to have surgery. It's usually a long diagnosis. They have to go through lots of antacids and things like that because usually they think it's GERD. But these patients literally after they eat, the pyloric sphincter doesn't close all the way, and what happens to that stomach contents? Just jumps out at you. Okay. This is usually just uh, young babies. Like three, yeah, babies. Three months and less, right? Quick, yeah. Usually three months six and less. Because usually by the age of three months, they fixed it by then. Malrotation is twisting of the bowel. Twisting of the bowel, what's going to happen to the blood supply? It's going to cut off, and all the gut that's below that's what's going to happen to it come in chronic and die, right? So this is a surgical emergency, these patients, ABCs, transport, transport position of comfort. There's a trend here. Is that going to be down. the answer for one of our questions? Yeah, what makes you think you're going to have questions to say that? Hoping. Hoping, that's easy, right? All right, assessment and management of gastrointestinal emergencies. Consider the following, their age and gender, just like we said earlier, you're not going to treat a three-month-old male the same as you would treat a 14-year-old female with GI problems, right? Ask if they were born premature. Why does that matter? They're more prone to problems and abnormalities, right? And if they're taking any current medications, if they had any similar problems. Also think about the ones that have, um, where's that? Oh, okay, we'll go back up. We'll get to G-tubes here in just a minute. Also check for dehydration and manage that appropriately. We've already discussed it, I'm not going to talk about it again. Hypoglycemia, we already said earlier that they don't keep a lot of stored glucose on board. So they're able to become hypoglycemic a lot sooner, a lot quicker. In your diabetic children, it's usually caused from too much insulin, a delayed or missed meal, or vigorous physical activity. So they either take too much insulin and don't eat enough. Do you need to close that computer? Are you sure? Um, they're missing meals and taking their insulin or taking their glucose medicine or they're depleting all their glucose for energy by being very um, physical. Signs and symptoms can be mild, moderate, and severe. What are some signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia? I'm hungry. That's one, right? Ultra mental status. Sweating, tremors, tachycardia, dizziness, headache. All things that are listed on that board. All right. <clears throat> severe symptoms are going to have a severe decrease in their level of consciousness and they can start to have seizures. Treatment for hypoglycemia, oral glucose is 5 to 45 grams PO. 
dextrose, your neonates and infants, get 200 to 500 milligrams per kilogram of what solution? 10 to 25. Neonates get what percent? Okay, um, infants get what? Pediatric patients less than a year, or excuse me, more than a year, get 25% of 0 0.5 to 1 gram per kilogram. Hyperglycemia is high levels of glucose in the blood can lead to dehydration, diabetic ketoacidosis, and coma. Either due to not taking their insulin medication or their other diabetic medication, eating things that they're not supposed to, poor diet, no exercise. Illness can also cause their blood sugar to go up. Early signs, they can have increased thirst, known as polydipsia, increased hunger, Increase urination. Late symptoms, they can have weakness, generalized aches and pains, nausea, vomiting, dehydration. They can go into diabetic ketoacidosis. What's that? Right, they start breaking down the fat and trying to use it for energy. Make ketones that circulate in the blood. What happens to their breath? It's supposed to get fruity. Especially get that acetone, fruity color, fruity smell. You know, patients, if you ever have anybody that huffs alcohol, they also have that acetone, fruity breath no. odor. No. Huffing like rubbing alcohol. They'll have that acetone. Because what's rubbing alcohol? When rubbing alcohol metabolizes, it also breaks down into acetone. And you have acetone circulating in the blood. Same as you do with diabetic ketoacidosis. If it's untreated, they can have Kuzma respirations and go into a coma. How do you treat hyperglycemia? Fluids for dehydration, position of comfort, ABCs, transport. Yeah, you're not going to give them insulin. Unless you carry it on the truck and your medical direction says go ahead and give them insulin, but I don't know anybody that carries insulin on the truck anywhere in the U.S. You don't have a refrigerator on the truck. Well, the new ones are starting to have. I don't know. I don't know who made that. The state said no, I guess. I'm sorry. Maybe you can find that out for us in the next class. Can you give us more? I'm not in your class. I'm not your teacher. I'm just a guest lecturer. No, it isn't. You're the only lecturer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> blood disorders. What are some blood disorders that kids might have? What's a very common blood disorder? Do you hear about single cell anemia? What kind of problems can that cause? Pain. pain, mostly, right? Usually, they're pain, having a lot of pain. What happens? What do you do for that? Oxygen, right? Because they're hypoxic. What happens to their cells, red blood cells? Or what do your red blood cells do? Let's start there. Cell. They carry, red blood cells carry the oxygen, right? If a patient has sickle cell anemia, what happens to their red blood cells? They form that sickle shape, right? Do they have that hole in the middle to carry oxygen? No. Nope. So does oxygen get transported throughout the body? No. All those sickle cells get in one little place, and what is not there? They have a little sickle party. They have a sickle party with no oxygen. Oxygen is not allowed, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens? Pain. Especially in their chest and abdomen and also in their extremities. Tons and tons and tons of pain. So we treat them by giving them how much oxygen? Lots and lots and lots, right? 15 liters of diameter breather. Give them a good amount of oxygen. They also are going to get IV fluids and what else? An IV, of course, that's a given. Um, rapid transport, ABCs. Hospital side, they're probably going to give them something for pain because they are in a lot of pain. Be very empathetic with these patients. It's nothing that they can help, it's nothing that they did to themselves, but they are in excruciating pain. So you really should treat them accordingly. All right, also other bleeding disorders like hemophilia, thrombocytopenia, keep them from injuring themselves or getting any injuries. If they do have bleeding, try to control it as best as possible. After obtaining a thorough history of patients with blood disorders, check to see if they have any chest pain or they have any weakness, if they had any recent trauma, they can cause internal bleeding. If they have a fever, bruising. Oh, 
Depending on the condition, they might need IV fluids, fluid resuscitation, pain control, rapid transport, manage their ABCs. Here's a little Tommy Toxin. As we said earlier, kids like to do what? Put things in their mouth that don't belong, right? Especially if they're being cared for by sometimes by grandparents who are not as aware of things that are on the floor, or especially if they're taken to somewhere that is not their normal environment. They can find pills and things like that on the floor. My in-laws used to keep Logan Wack when he was little, and they thought it was okay for to let him play with pill bottles and those little um, weekly pill things. That There wasn't anything in them, but why can't he play with that? Like if you let him play with it now when he goes and gets Josh's out of the cabinet and takes his medicine that he has in there, it can be dangerous. You only kids play with stuff like that. Just, Identify common sources of problems where they can get poisonings from. Check their signs and symptoms. Of course, call medical direction. Who else do you need to call? Poison control. Poison control. <laughs> Manage their ABCs, position of comfort, transport. Gastric lavage if ingestion is less than one hour depending on what they've taken. You don't gastric lavage something that's very volatile, like a liquid, right? Like if they swallowed, um, I had a kid swallow an entire container of that kerosene that goes in the tiki torches. Why he drank that, I have no idea. Still to this day, I have no idea. I can understand antifreeze or coolant because it's fruity and looks pretty. That's why a lot of kids overdose on antifreeze and coolant because it actually has a sweet taste to it. And so it's pretty colors. But this kid drank, you know those little bottles of kerosene that come with tiki torches? He drank an entire thing of that. I don't know what he was thinking. <laughs> All right, what is sudden infant death syndrome? SIDS, right? What is that? Huh? They just stop breathing and die for no reason whatsoever. What are some risk factors? Prematurity? Risk factors that can cause sudden infant death syndrome. Prematurity. They used to say birth low birth weight. Positioning. Positioning. Put them on their back. Is it still like that? Yeah, it's still like that. They say back is best. As soon as Annabelle could roll over, she rolled over on her belly and slept that way ever since. She will not sleep on her back at all. All right, what else? I did freak out for a while. Exposure to tobacco patients who, um, whose parents smoke. History of minor illnesses that occur within two weeks before death. <laughs> Who's at risk for SIDS? How about age group? Infants under the age of one, right? Also, things that are in their crib. You don't put anything in their crib. No blankets, no bumpers, no stuffed animals. We have a mesh bumper. Did you know they made mesh bumpers now? I didn't know that. They didn't have those when Logan was a baby. But um, instead of using the bumpers that come with the bedding stuff, they have these mesh bumpers that are supposed to be 100% good to use for people or for babies under the age of one. I went and bought one when Annabelle started sleeping in her own bed because so I was terrified that she's going to get up against that bumper and suffocate and die. That's all I could think about. I hate SIDS. I hate talking about SIDS. I hate thinking about it. But now she sleeps with one of those Afghan knitted blankets. She sleeps with one of those that have all the holes in it. I won't let her sleep with an actual real blanket. <laughs> I keep her bundled up in her little ones or her sleeper thing, but she does sleep with a little Afghan blanket. And now she's got a Sophia doll. Y'all know, y'all don't have, a lot of y'all have children that are small. You haven't know who Sophia is. Princess Sophia? No, You don't have a girl? I thought you had a little girl, too. Oh, uh, well, no, you probably don't know who Princess Sophia is. Any of y'all know who Princess Sophia is? Tammy, you have a little girl. Sophia the first? Oh. She got that little doll when we were at Disney, so she sleeps with that now. So it was Princess Sophia? Little princess doll. Princess Sophia, she's a um, character off of Disney Junior. Sophia the First is her TV show. She was a girl living in a village doing all right. She became a princess overnight. Have you seen the trailer? Oh, right. Have you watched it? Yeah, too much. Yes. Have you seen the trailer? No. Logan has it on his little iPad thing. We did downloads, but we ha I haven't watched it. How many times have you watched Frozen? <laughs> a thousand. I feel like we watch that movie every day. I've seen Frozen a few times. Frozen's really, it's a really cute movie. Um, signs and symptoms of sudden infant death syndrome. They can have rigor mortis, lividity can be set in. Um, they can also have this pink frothy sputum coming from their mouth. 
They're not have any external signs and symptoms, no wounds of any sort. They're just found in the bed. Dead. Pathophysiology is unknown. It's really all I want you to know about SIDS. Child abuse, this is the part of the lecture that I absolutely despise because I despise child abuse and anybody that abuses children. You just want to kill them. Um, yes. Oh, when you go and I'm sorry, we should have talked about that a while ago. When you do arrive on scene of a SIDS baby, usually it's called in as a, my baby's not breathing or something, and you treat it just like a cardiac arrest or a respiratory arrest. You try to look for any signs of life, hook them up to the monitor, try to do anything that you can, but also make sure that you're aware of your surroundings. Note where the baby is found, what they look like, because you're going to disrupt that. You're going to have to take them up and try to see what you can do to fix them or save them if you can do anything. Now, if rigor mortis and lividity is already set in, you're going to call the coroner. You're not going to touch them. It's nothing you're going to be able to do. Not when they've got rigor mortis or lividity already set in, you're not going to be able to work anything. Child abuse, you need to follow your local protocols about reporting abuse. Anytime you respond to a pediatric call, always check the surroundings, look for scene safety, anything that can be hurtful or harmful to the pediatric patient. Look for any forms of malnutrition, malnutrition or maltreatment. How their clothes look? Are their clothes all ratted and torn? Do they look like they're cared for? Do they look neglectful, like they've been neglected? What are some factors that can lead people to be abusers? Being abused themselves? Alcohol or drug use? Being disturbed. <laughs> Economic status, low class. Stress. Could you imagine being a single parent of like five children and having to work all the time and nobody there to help you? What kind of stressful environment that would be? Would Is that you? Do you have five children? I would advocate that. You would? <laughs> um, I mean, things like that, that stressful situation you know, that can front, make people prone to be abusers. Child abuse usually reflects a pattern of unstable behavior, typically not a single act of violence. In case of physical abuse, most abusers tend to be unhappy, angry adults. Generally not happy people at all. They're usually isolated, often under extreme stress, which is never okay. It's not, you can't use that as a reason. Just because you're stressed out doesn't mean you have a reason to go beat your kid. That's just a niche for them to have. They were often a victim of physical or emotional abuse as children and themselves. Abused children often contain characteristics that increase their risk for abuse, such as hyperactivity. Can you imagine being an ADHD kid to an abused, child, abused adult? I mean, that's going to be a stressful situation anyway, right? Hyperactive, hyperactive kids are stressful enough. They're demanding and have difficult behavior. They have a decreased level of functioning, like if they were handicapped in some way. They're often seen by, they often Parents often see this abused child as special or different from other siblings, which is kind of sad. Other factors, children are usually under the age of five, and boys are more abused than females. Really? Mm -hmm. Females are more sexually abused than males, but males are more physically abused. Can occur any time in the child's life. Common crisis associated with episode of child abuse, financial stress, we're going to talk about some of this, death of the family member birth of a sibling. Loss of employment, eviction from housing, any of these things can be stressful. Ultimate diagnosis usually begins with suspicions based on unexplained injuries. Like you've been to Tommy's house five times in a month for a fall. He just keeps falling. He's six years old. He should know how to walk by now. That should be a trigger for you. You do. You suspect abuse, you try to get the child out of that environment and notify police. Are we supposed to relay it to the ER every time Yep. Um, a discrepant history. You have a three month old that rolled off the couch and busted their head and is now unresponsive. Can that happen? Yeah. It can. But would you have a high index for suspicion of maybe child abuse? Yes. yes. Delays in seeking medical care. Well, I thought she was fine, but I guess she's not. Now she's unresponsive. Repeated episodes of suspicious injuries. 
or if you notice suspicious bruising or different patterns of bruising, like you notice six different bruises on the kid when you're doing your assessment and they're all in different stages of healing. 15 indicators of possible abuse. Any obvious or suspected fractures in a child under the age of two? Why is that? Because their bones are normally breaking. It takes a lot of force to break them. All right. Injuries in vigorous stages of healing, especially burns or bruises. We're going to talk about that. More injuries than usually seen in other children at the same age. Injuries scattered on many different areas of the body. Bruises or burns in patterns that suggest intentional infliction, like cigarette burns. Suspected increase in cranial pressure in an infant. Suspected intra-abdominal trauma in a young child. Any injury that does not fit the description of the cause. Long-standing skin infections. That would be neglect, right? Kind of neglect. Accusation of child injured himself or herself intentionally. Extreme malnutrition. Extreme lack of cleanliness. They're just dirty children. Inappropriate clothing for the situation. Like uh, it's 40 degrees outside and they're barefoot in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. Child who withdraws from a parent and is eager to go with somebody else. Child who responds inappropriately to any type of situation. Physical findings, you can find burns, welts, multiple variety of dispersed bruises, bruises in any area, human hand marks or bite marks. Where would you expect to see bruising on a three-month-old infant? Where would you expect to see bruising on a three-month-old infant? <laughs> you in La La Land over there, Stephanie? Yeah. You're not going to see bruising anywhere on a three-month-old infant. They can't do anything. They can't even roll over yet. Yeah. No, where would you expect to see bruising on a three-month-old infant without thinking about abuse? Okay. Sorry. Is that why y'all chose arms and back? Yes, I was like something about that. You would not expect, you don't ever expect to see bruising on anybody, but like a five-year-old, where would you expect to see bruising on? Their legs, their legs right? And their arms. You said no one. Yeah. At three-month-old, you would not expect to see bruising at all because they're not mobile, right? They can't move. Other than squirm a little bit. They're not going to be rolling over, they're not going to be crawling, they're not going to be doing any of that. A three-year-old or a five-year-old, you're going to expect to see bruises pretty much everywhere. On the legs, the arms, because they run into things. You're high five them by there. Yeah. <laughs> Abdominal visceral injury. This is usually due to traumatic child abuse. The parents are hurting the children, um, using them as punching bags or hitting them with objects, causing some type of internal abdominal injury. Bone injuries. More than 20% of physically abused children have positive results of x-rays, fractured ribs, different extremities. Injuries from sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is a symptom of serious disturbed family relationship. Uh, I mean, nobody wants to go and have sex with their daughter. I mean, that's just definitely disturbed. So, no. Often sexually abusive adult receives similar types of abuse as a child. Yes? So like the fractures you usually see on a kid, aren't they usually like a spiral fracture? You will have spiral fractures because they do that twisting twist. motion. Yeah. Yeah, some kids can get spiral fractures, especially if they are trying to crawl out of their crib and their leg gets caught yeah. and it can twist. And catch that way, but a spiral fracture is 95% child abuse. I remember we had a patient come in one time, their um, father was a cop and their mother was a stay at home mom, or whatever, and they went to crawl out of the crib or something and fractured their femur. They had a spiral fracture. I mean, you had DHR, police, everybody that could possibly be there was there investigating it because, I mean, spiral fractures are 95% child abuse. That's a hard bone to break. Yeah. Very, very hard bone to break. And then I was going to say, one time I remember they had a kid in the ER. They actually called Dr. Warren in because he wasn't on call that day. He ended up having a, like a bad brain, brain bleed. That was hard for him. They had to fly him out, but they couldn't because of the pressure. So they, we actually, I went down there with Dr. Bridges and stuff. We took him up, we took him up to the OR. We broke the rail to the OR. We took him up to the OR. Because he would crash and get detached right there. Did, what the UAV did make it 
The adults can justify this behavior in their own mind, which I guess can make it make them feel like that it's okay. And the family relationship is very complex. Usually, one of, both adults know about it, but one of them just stays shut up. And it's usually the mom that's very quiet and doesn't open her mouth at all, while the father's the one doing the abuse. It can include vaginal intercourse, anal, oral genital contact, type of molestation. In many cases, the victim is a girl, and they're usually under the age of 12. Because what happens around age 12? Puberty starts, and what happens? They are at risk to get pregnant, and then the secret can be known, right? Physical findings that suggest child abuse, pregnancy, or venereal disease in a child under the age of 12. Painful urination or defecation. Let me just stop right there, too. A girl can still get pregnant if she hasn't hit puberty yet. She can. She can. Just because she hasn't started her physical period cycle and her ovaries are developed, if she is exploiting eggs, she can get pregnant. Just like you can get pregnant while you're on your period. Why would you do that anyway? But that's just kind of gross. But you can get pregnant while you're on your period or right after you have your cycle, you can get pregnant. Just whenever your eggs decide to pop out. It's supposed to be that 14 day thing that we talked about when we did GYN and OB. Stranger things have happened. Also, if they have tenderness or laceration in the perineal area, bleeding from the rectum or the vagina, presence of dried blood, semen, or pubic hair in the genital area of a child. Children usually don't have pubic hair, so if there's pubic hair found on there, then somebody's been down there putting it down there. Emergency care, manage their injuries, give as much emotional support as possible. Try to get them away from possible abusers. Um, children require compassionate support. Be compassionate, be empathetic. Try to get on their level. If possible, same-sex paramedics should do the interview with the child. Also, report everything. Y'all need a break? You're good? You go. Yeah, like, we got like 50. 50 or so. Oh, yeah. yeah, we need a break. We're being very good paying attention. Come on, children. All right, infants with special needs. No. When you have an infant with special needs, you're worried about all of their equipment and things that you're going to have, like ventilator care, <laughs> ostomies, G tubes, shunts. Central lines, all of these things. These patients are often cared for at home by family members. And the thing to remember is usually their parents or caregivers that are taking care of them know a lot about their diagnosis. They also know a lot about the equipment that they're using. But they're considered experts, so use them, use their knowledge. I mean, how many of y'all know how to do function with the G tubes or the home ventilators? You know, the parents are going to be very knowledgeable, so use them, gain their knowledge and skills. Tracheostomy tubes. <laughs> they have a few associated risk complications, usually obstruction, air leaks, bleeding, dislodgement, some type of infection. <laughs> Aseptic technique is good to have when dealing with tracheostomies. Okay. Um, if it becomes clogged or blocked, usually the home care person can help take care of this, but sometimes they might need to call you, and you might have to get out your suction kit. Now, do you use a regular suction to suction out a tracheostomy? No, what do you use? French tip. French tip, tracheostomy suction. It's usually about, what, like a 14, 16 French? You usually have to have sterile water, sterile gloves. Home artificial ventilators. A lot of people usually call with these. I was Power went out, battery's gone, or it's malfunctioning. Best thing to do is unhook it and use a BVM, right? Hook it up and ventilate. Central lines, you don't do anything with these unless there's a problem or an abnormality. If there's a leak in the central line, like if there's a um, one of the tubes has become lacerated somehow and there's a leak in the tube, you have to clamp it between the tube and the patient. Put an occlusive direct something over that to keep the air from going in. You guys can access ports and triple lumens. Um, we're going to talk about that in the lab. You can use those if you need to out in the field. Management for a torn or leaking catheter or cracked line can lead to air embolism. So you stop the infusion immediately and clamp the catheter between the tear and the patient. The patient develops altered level of consciousness indicating possible air embolism. You put them on their left side. Why is that? So that the air gets trapped in the heart, right? So it doesn't go through the lungs. It causes pulmonary embolism, causes them to quit breathing. They need high concentration of O2, so 15 liters non-rebreather. 
IV access, rapid transport. If you're having any bleeding from those sites, you need to control bleeding as best as possible. G-tubes, you're not going to do anything with the G-tubes. Other than if they come out, put a sterile wet gauze dressing over that area. This was to become dislodged. Right here you see the G-tube in place. If it was to become dislodged, if home health care was there, they could take a Foley and put it in that spot just to keep it from growing up. But you just need to apply some sterile wet gauze and put a dressing over it. Potential complications, they can become obstructed. The patient can have aspiration issues. These are just going to manage their ABCs and transport. Shunts, we talked about shunts a while ago. We talked about increased intracranial pressure and hydrocephalus. If they become clogged or kinked or backed up, they're going to cause increased intracranial pressure and headaches. You're going to manage that ICP. Airway breathing, circulation, transport. This is an example of a shunt. They have some that go into the heart, which are very uncommon. The rest of them go into the abdominal area and shut the fluid there. They're inserted through a borehole. They can have external shunts and internal shunts. They have headache, nausea, vomiting, any of those complications that show as signs of increased intracranial pressure. They also have Cushing's triad. What's that? Cushing's triad. High blood pressure, high blood pressure, low heart rate, and irregular respirations, right? That's not it. So you have an elevated blood pressure, right? Decreased heart rate, and irregular respirations. I guess I should draw it on there so it'd show up. But. Elevated blood pressure, decreased heart rate, and irregular respirations. That's a triad for increased intracranial pressure. That's across the board, though. That's not just pediatric patients, it's everybody. What'd you say? Thank you. That's how I remember it. Increased blood pressure, decreased heart rate, and irregular respirations. And that's anybody. Adults, peas, anybody that's got increased intracranial pressure. These patients, like we said earlier, ABCs, rapid transport. Your pediatric trauma emergency is leading cause of death among children older than the age of one. We already talked about the A and P differences. Blunt trauma um, is 90% causes, or excuse me, makes up 90% of pediatric injuries. They don't usually have penetrating trauma. They're not at risk for gunshot wounds or knife stabbings. Usually it's blunt force trauma, counts for about 90% of the mechanism of injury. Usually from a fall or they've been hit by a car because they're chasing a red ball out of the parking lot. Falls, as I said earlier, are very common. Motor vehicle crashes can result in a variety of injury patterns depending on the restraints used. Have you ever just drove around town and watched people while you're driving, yeah. looking in the back of people's cars? How many people do you see not in seatbelts? A lot. I really, I'm a very observant driver. I, I watch everybody. I mean, I watch the road, too, but I, I have to watch people around me because people are stupid. People don't know how to drive exactly. at all. they're looking to other people's cars. You don't want yeah. to drive it. Shut up. <laughs> um, but I'm very observant, and I see, at least on a daily basis, children playing in the back seat, not in seat belts. People, kids that should be strapped in car seats, not in car seats. That's very dangerous. I mean, if they were to wreck, kids can get thrown out of the vehicle, have tons of injuries and damage. Assessment management of your traumatic injuries always begin with a thorough seam size up as you do with anything else. Use your patient assessment triangle because we're going to look at their what? A stands for appearance. appearance, work of breathing, and circulation, right? You know what the pediatric assessment triangle is? I'm already yawning. Why can't I quit yawning? Jump up and down. All right. A new thor move. thorax can be present with penetrating chest trauma or trauma to the chest and upper, upper abdomen. Use needle decompression for this, just like we talked about airway. It's not anything new for you. They can have tachycardia, jugular vein distension, pulses paradoxus. What does that mean? Oh, uh, like the pressure. Their blood pressure drops and they inhale. When they take a breath, their blood pressure drops. Okay. 
blood pressure. When does the radial pulse? What do you do with the radial pulse? Their pulses will drop, and their pressure is also going to drop. But what is that? You don't All right, any trauma patient should be considered to be at risk for developing shock. That's a given, right? We're not going to check your blood pressure on anybody under the age of three because it's not going to do you any good anyway because the blood pressure is a late sign. Hypertension is a late sign to shock, remember? Once your ABCs are stabilized, continue assessment of disability with the ABPU because we've done ABC. Actually, if it's a traumatic event, then we have to stabilize the C-spine. Done ABC, moving on to D, and D is what? D. Disability, that's right, Miss Tammy. Thank you for paying attention. And you check disability with what? APU, which is what? What's E? Remember back to patient assessment, what's E? We expose our patients. Remember? Expose and then cover them back up. Okay. Play a cervical collar, and we already did that. Treating any fractures, cover them, keep them nice and warm. Rapid trauma assessment, fixing the life threats or any problems or abnormalities that you find during your rapid trauma assessment. Significant MOI, they are a load and go. <clears throat> All trauma victims with suspected spinal cord injuries require spinal stabilization. Do not place a collar that is too big on a child. Is it going to stabilize them? No. no. Make sure you get the appropriate size cuff. But they're in a car seat. Do you take them out and put them on a the backboard? No. No, you can leave them in the car seat, right? Pad and tape appropriately. That's my carry duct tape on the truck. If patient is stable, obtain an additional history. Provide a thorough physical exam. Pain is often undertreated in children. Use tools to elicit patient self-report. Those little um, happy face diagrams. Whether they're smiling or crying. And if they're crying and complaining of severe pain, they're probably at level 10 on a scale of 0 to 10, right? Kids aren't old enough to understand what's the worst pain. Right now, they think the, pain, the worst pain they've ever had is the pain they've got right now. Keep them calm. Reassure them. Keep their comfort measures, like Hudson said earlier, stuffed animals. Let them bring something from home if possible. Also, keep their parents and caregivers close by. Burns. Do you remember about burns? Back from basic and then advanced. It's a rule of nines. It's really not really the rule of nines much anymore. Um, you can see that an infant and child, infant's head is 18, where a child is 12. Whole torso, abdomen area is 18 on both. Genitals always one on both. Pediatric patients, their um, infants or legs are 13 and a half apiece. Over the age of one is 16 and a half. Arms are both nine. Burns are suggestive of abuse. I mean, unless the kid comes and pulls a hot thing of boiling water off on top of them, most of your burns are from abuse. Remove burning clothing, Report that support the ABCs with 100% O2. What do you cover burns with? Dry, sterile, dry, sterile dressing. You don't put all that cream and ointment stuff on them? No. Dry, sterile dressings. Dry, sterile dressings. Clean them minimally. Unless there's dirt and debris on top of them, you really don't do anything with them other than cover and get them to the hospital. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? You know what they say? Best way to prevent any injuries is where you're restraining devices, like when you're in a car, seat belts, car seats. Also help to keep your patient um, vaccinated, to keep them from getting any types of infections. Keep them away from injuries, such as submersion incidences, poisonings, burns, things like that. Try to be mindful of what is around you. Oh, that was quick. This is my baby. Isn't she cute? Oh, wait. Let me bring her back. Isn't she pretty? There's a little girl that made this for her. It's a hat. It's like a little bonnet hat with rabbit ears. I don't know why. She actually wore it for about five seconds. Long enough for her to look at me and me take this picture. And then she started pulling it off. She doesn't like anything in her head. She does keep a little bitty bow. I'm not one of those moms that puts them big bows in your hair. That's kind of weird. Um, but we do the small little bitty bows. You don't put the one that wraps around that.